recording going yes. If you have a um, problem making something perfectly round, symmetrical, there's a couple of easy things that you can do. One is turn your drawing upside down. Because chances are you've got one side that works. You can get a good line on one side, and but you can't get it going the other direction very well. So just turn it. And the more you turn it, the more you'll see where it's out of round. You can just kind of massage it into shape. So this is what you can't do on the computer so much. You can if you use that, that, that rotate tool that they've got um, on Photoshop that rotates the paper, but I always have a hard time getting it back into its proper place. And because it's not physical, <laughs> you know? I like the physical. So then my the other thing that you can do is you can look at your drawing in a mirror and find the um where it's when you see something in reverse, it's gonna pop right out at you that you can't that you're not symmetrical. So I want, don't want this to be too dark. This is the light side of the ball. So I'm going to lighten up this bit here. And what we're going to be working with instead of line, like you did with the blind contour, is um, actually value. Uh, it's got to be bigger. Okay, so it's, not, it's so close to me that it's distorted, and it's going to be difficult to get this. And one more gnat down. <laughs> I don't know where they come from. I think it's, I overwater my plants in the winter, and so they breed. So you can see that even at this short of an angle, the actually the drawing, the photograph on the screen is more distorted than my actual image in front of me. But you can see that how that is definitely moving into the distance. It also makes, it, the ball looks bigger on my computer screen than it does on the actual box, which is really strange, but it does. I don't quite know why. It's gotta be just camera distortion. So I'm gonna keep looking at my actual, most of the things will be the same, except for the proportions are gonna be off a little bit. And once you get it kind of sketched in, and it's like a gesture drawing at first. Everything starts out as a gesture drawing. Then you turn it into a, um, a value study. So the main shadow that we got have on the object is the core shadow. And that's going to be, if you have, if you have a round thing and you have a light, and the light, for most intents and purposes, especially for small objects, the light's going to be directional like this. And when you get into the 3D modeling, if you get into that, you'll find that they have settings that set the light like this, which is more like sunlight, or that it sets the light out as a cone, which is more like a lamp. Both ways um, are true. This is, would be like a cone if we weren't so tiny compared to the sun. So the light comes down and is blocked by the object here and here. So the darkest part of the object is just past the place where it, the light is falls off. So the light comes down and bounces like this and gets more and more angled off and so it becomes fainter and fainter. And then it's empty here. And this is totally black. This is like um almost like if this was the North Pole, this is the equator. And then the light that does get by and gets to the surface and bounces up into the bottom and underside of the um, object so that this gets lighter. So this place right here, and then it gets cut off again as the light gets bounces back, it gets cut off again. So this stays dark. The light never really hits this, this core shadow as the darkest point on the object. And that's why it's the darkest point. So it transitions though, because it's on a round object, it's not a hard edge. It's a very soft edge. The hard edge is of course, the background where the object ends and the background picks up. So you'll have not a line, really. It should be value. So using the charcoal is 
great for the value because you can really fill it in quickly. So we get this. The background defines the object. The dark defines the light. And as things get closer to the light object, they get brighter. They get darker as you get closer to the light and lighter as you get closer to the dark. So the contrast increases up to the point of contact. So squint at your object and see where the main areas of light and dark out. It knocks out all the little tiny distinctions. So when I squint at my ball sitting in front of the black, this point almost disappears completely. It doesn't on the camera, but it does in real life. So this is going to be almost the same value as the core shadow. It almost disappears. And sometimes you really want to have a little bit of disappearing action when you're drawing a figure because it's, as an artist, artistically, leaving it a little bit open to its environment makes it feel a little more three-dimensional. So it's not completely cut off from its environment. Oh, the other thing that um, is often not mentioned in beginning drawing classes and painting classes too, I was actually helping one of my daughter, one of my daughter's friends with her painting. And she was doing this painting of a, of a green bottle and green apples against a white cloth. And she couldn't get the color of the bottle. Well, the problem was is that the white of her canvas was so white that she couldn't really see the color. So you want to tone down. That's why it's good to work on gray, because it's a middle, a middle value that you can then go up or down. So let's see. So that's the core. This part of the ball is reflected light. And then this part here is the cast shadow. And since it's a ball, it's sitting up a little bit. It you know, only touches the box, this one little tiny point. So you get a little bit of a overhang kind of effect with the ball. So since, I'm just going to stick with a charcoal pencil here. Since this is a cast shadow, it's going to be a sharp transition, especially close to the object. And it's darkest under, directly underneath the object. This is still shadow, but it's lighter. And then it gets darker to the core. And then it gradually blends out. And this is, then you can start blending, really smoothing this stuff out. You can do it all with just line work. I've done it, but I do it both ways. Sometimes it's all just line work and I don't smear or smudge at all. And sometimes I just go crazy with the smudge because it's so cool. It's like sculpting. And then again, this is darker. It's not a line, but it's a shadow form. It's darker. Almost don't even need to look at something to draw this. I mean, I don't have to look at something to draw this because it's it's just science. It's just the way it goes. So you become familiar with it, and then you're able to make it up whenever you want. That's the whole point of doing it from life. <laughs> Once you understand it, you can see it and understand it, then you can make it up whenever you want to and have your fantasy. So you see how that looks really three-dimensional already? And it's still really rough. Now, light does an interesting thing. When you look at the the actual still life there, there's an area in the back where the light is slipping through and hitting another object underneath, which gives us a great opportunity to use to look at this effect. We have the shadow. And it's, a, it's a cast shadow of the fabric on a, the box behind it. And this is darker obviously, and the box is light. But then when it gets light, there's a little bit of a dark edge here. And the dark edge is on the box because the box kind of curves over the edge. So there's a tad bit of light on this side. And then this side gets dark again. 
and it's a little bit darker than what's behind it. Oh, I can see that there's a little white reflected light hitting it too. This is an edge, so it's sharp. So you start playing with these sharp edges versus soft edges, and things will start taking on a different kind of quality. So here, this is really sharp as it passes across the white area, but then it gets, it appears as if it goes white or lighter again as it goes in front of the dark area. It's really just a change in contrast. But we can accentuate it and push it and make it more so, which makes it more realistic because it's slightly exaggerated. So it's almost like you don't want to do exactly reality because you might as well just take a photograph and have it done with it, right? We want to do better than reality. We want to understand reality so that we can create pretend reality <laughs> whenever we want to. I mean, it's not why most people are taking these courses. It's because they want to make up stuff and make it look real. Everybody does art for different reasons. But most of the people are doing art in this school so that they can get into entertainment industry. So to do that, you really have to understand how space really works. If you don't care how space really works and you don't want to make up realistic objects that are going to look like they're sitting there in front of you, even though they've never existed anywhere before, of course, there's nothing new under the sun, and you just want to do abstract stuff or pretty, you know, pretty colors, or you want to display your emotions, you want to, you know, to work, it, it's, a different, it's a different kind of art. Expressive art is great, but it's a different kind of art, and it's not what you will get you hired at a games company. You know, it's great to have the imagination, but if you haven't got the skills, it's like if, if you like to play um, on violin, but you never learned the right way to play, but you like the sound that you're making with it, you could be an experimental musician, sure, but you're probably not going to get hired by the Philadelphia Philharmonic, right? Because they want you to sound like a violin is supposed to sound. So there's two. it's not that playing it a different way is wrong or bad. It's just where do you want to take it? What do you want to do with it? Where are you going to go with it? If you are really good at throwing a ball into a, a ring on the side of your garage and you're over six foot tall, you could probably get a job as a basketball player. But if your idea of playing ball is to throw the ball is just anywhere else except at the basket, I don't know. I'm just trying to make up analogies here probably meaningless, but there is, I'm seeing another secondary shadow, so I really need to cut the light coming from my monitor. Can you see the difference when I do that? So that light should be eliminated because it's confusing. So block it. And that's a little bit better, though it's reflected barely. Yeah, I can hardly hear you at all. It's all right. It's all right, man. You don't have a headset or something? So you see we get a little extra double whammy of reflected light into the shadow space here. So the light, imagine the light is like a ping pong ball that's bouncing all over the place. So the insides of the shadows are going to be a little bit lighter than the outsides of the shadows. And that gives the shadow a little bit more substance as well. It's not just a, a cutout on a piece of, on a flat surface, but is that actually a, and this gets a little softer. As the light gets away from the object, further and further from the object, the light just breaks up more. So the edges of the cast shadow get softer and more diffuse, and closer to the object they get sharper and more defined. So manipulating that, learning how to manipulate that means that you can make it up. So if I wanted to pretend that I had another, like I had a hole in my box here, say I had a round hole in my box, I could make that up without looking at reference materials to it. I know that it's going to have a thickness because it's made out of wood, so I'm going to put 
edge of the thickness in there. And the hole itself is going to be black because it's going to be inside. Inside of the box is dark. And this is a sharp edge because it's this is where the wood ends and the air inside begins. And then this is going to be a value. It's going to get a little bit darker closer to the light than it is on the inside. <laughs> now I made a hole in my box. And it might even have a little hot white sparkle on this, this side. If I can get this dark enough, I can get this little bit of a shadow coming in on the side here. Anything to make it a little a little more real. I'm going to make that transition a little bit less pronounced. So less, less of an outline and more of a transition. I wish I had made the wood a little thicker. I think I put a crack in the box. I love doing cracks on things. This will be the inside of the box, so we might see has it overlap there. Let's say this piece of wood. Oh man, I didn't I didn't think this through. to see it. See, this is something I would need to have a model for because I'm not totally clear on what the inside of the box, how much of the inside of the box I would see. Let's say put some splinters here. Want to have lines. This would be this would be catching the light. Yeah, this doesn't look out so great. I need to have I need to have a broken box so that I can see the structure of the box because I'm not sure if it's if it's got a piece of wood on top or if the piece of the wood comes up from the side or if it's even a dovetail construction. So all these things you got to figure out before you get too far into it. Do you have a crack on anything? Shadow. <laughs> it starts to look like a, a real crack. Another good reason to draw on colored paper so that you can use you can't really use white on newsprint so much it doesn't it doesn't pick up so great so it's not going to do it for me unless I tone all of this down just under white because I only can't have anything whiter than white right so only the most highest highlight can represent white. If 
you want to have a highlight on your ball, you need to tone down the ball, the white ball around it. Somebody had, the next, the other project to do is eggs, and somebody had a cracked egg, and I thought that was really cool, because then I started drawing cracked eggs, because I thought you can really make it look like it's, it's a real fun thing to uh, fake out, it's a crack in something. Yeah, I'm using a, oh, is that better? I am using a wireless headset, and I had it stuck over my head, because I was drinking my coffee, so my voice is probably far away. All right. Yeah, Vine does have its limitations.